Well, good day. Uh, well, let's get stuck into God's Word. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your Word. Uh, and as we deal with this passage before us today, uh, we pray that your Spirit would help us as we seek understanding, as we seek your truth, as we seek to know you better, to know Jesus better, and to live lives that bring honour and glory to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's read. We're going to read Matthew chapter 12. We're continuing on in chapter 12, uh, starting at verse 38 through to verse 45. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, oh, I'll return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be for this wicked generation. All right, some uh, uh, pretty stark words by Jesus. Something a little bit perhaps uh, confusing as, as you first read. You might have some questions. And if you do, uh, click on the link in the description, submit uh, the question via our, our page on our website, and uh, yeah, I'll have a crack at answering it. Um, in the next video that I do, I'll ask a question. So, uh, this passage before us today... Um, is challenging. Um, it, it really strikes at the heart of, of uh, the way people sometimes approach um, the idea of God or Jesus and the gospel. Uh, and the question it really asks us is, are you looking for a sign? Uh, you know, are you wanting proof before you believe in Jesus? Uh, at first, it seems not all the Pharisees thought Jesus was batting for Team Satan. I remember previous passage where that was what they accused him of, uh, uh, they ask Jesus to do a miracle. They want Jesus to prove um, who he is, or who he claims to be, I should say, or who some people suspect that he might be, that is, the Messiah. But it does just stop and wait and, and, and uh, ask, sorry, let's just stop and reflect for a moment how ludicrous that question is. Because the Pharisees have witnessed all sorts of signs already. And they want Jesus to do one more. right? They've tried to trap Jesus in his words. They've set in motion uh, to get Jesus killed. They've accused him of being in cohorts with Satan. And now they want a sign again? So that they may what? Believe? But Jesus calls them on it. He effectively says, there is no sign I can do that will convince you of the truth. Pharisees want a sign. The Pharisees will get a sign, says Jesus. But they won't believe. They won't repent, even though it will be the greatest sign God has given his people. And because of that, what Jesus goes on to say effectively is that this generation within Israel is even worse, is even in a worse state than the Israel uh, that was in that was uh, exiled in the Old Testament, and the reason is they're rejecting the Messiah. They'll get a sign. It'll be the greatest sign that ever was. Uh, it will be the death and resurrection of the Son of God. But even when that happens, they won't repent. They won't believe. Now, Jesus points out how. 
really, the good news, the gospel message should be enough. After all, the Ninevites, uh, who we read about in the book of Jonah, they didn't repent because they saw the sign of Jonah. It wasn't like they were standing on the beach and watched the whale spit him out. No, they repented at the message that Jonah preached. And the Queen of Sheba, she didn't come to Solomon to see him perform some magic tricks. She came to listen to his wisdom. It's the word that's going to change people. It's the gospel message that's going to convince people, if you like, or going to work in people's lives to make them believe. The, the image of pagans, right, pagan nations rising at the judgment to condemn um, Jesus' generation of Israel would have, would have absolutely horrified them. Right? Many at that time would have expected the day of judgment would be the time when Israel would be vindicated and there would be victory over the nations on that time, in that time. But for Nineveh and and the Queen of Sheba, the, the Queen from the South, to rise up at that time and to condemn Israel? Oh, Jesus is saying something incredibly powerful at that moment. And it's basically this. You don't get it. And you should get it because you're the people of God. They're rejecting the one that they've been longing for, the Messiah. Right? And signs just aren't going to convince anyone. But if, you, if you need proof, then that's... You, you, you're barking up the wrong tree, says Jesus. Paul says the same thing, in effect, when he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel, the good news. You know, people often make the claim, um, you know, I, I want proof. I, Prove to me God exists, then I'll believe. But the fact of the matter is, there's plenty of evidence. We have the New Testament. Right? It's, it's an historical document. The most attested historical document in the history of the world. Right? We have the apostles and the mission that they embarked on, proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. Right, and we've, got to, we've got to contemplate the life that they lived to proclaim that message. When at the time of Jesus' death, they were running scared for their lives. Then something significant happened, so much so that it changed their posture, it changed their attitude, that they fearlessly went out and proclaimed the gospel and paid for that with their lives. And then we look at the history of the world and the history of the church. Right? The gospel literally changed the world. In some respects, it conquered the Roman Empire. There's evidence. There's plenty of evidence. The question is, not, well, what's the proof uh, that you can give me? Really, people who want proof are just like the Pharisees. They don't want to believe. You know, unbelief is effectively willful ignorance. Now, Jesus goes on in this passage uh, to explain something. And to our ears, at first glance, it, it's a bit strange. Uh, but he, let me help. Let me see if I can help you understand. So uh, in verses 43 to 45, right? Uh, we need to understand it as a kind of picture uh, image of what happened to Israel and where they're at now. So God kicked Israel out of the promised land. You can read about it in the Old Testament, uh, the book of 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. Uh, it kicked them out of the land. They had turned their back on God. Um, and so God kicked them out, sent them into exile, off to Babylon, and he left the temple, the place where he said he would dwell in the midst of his people. Right? They had Israel had turned their back on God and they were worshipping other gods, and so God's left. And in this time, this is this is what Jesus talks about, the unclean or the evil spirit. Um, 
left Israel. Right? This, the time of exile was, a, was a kind of like a time of cleansing. Uh, and then eventually the remnant of Israel, the people of Israel, return to the land. They rebuild God's house. House is a, often a way that the temple is spoken about. And they've swept it clean. They've put it in order. But there's one problem. It's empty. God's not there. Right? It's unoccupied. In effect, they were still in exile because God had not returned to dwell amongst his people. They are in the land, but God wasn't there with them. Now, God does return to the temple. He returns to the temple in the person of Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself, just a, a little bit further back in, the, in, in uh, Matthew, said, what did he say? The one greater than the temple is here. Referring to himself. He is the new temple. Jesus is the place where heaven and earth meet. Jesus is the presence of God in the midst of his people. He is our Emmanuel, God with us. And since the house, the actual temple, the physical building was empty, what does Jesus say in his little uh, image? Well, evil returns, even worse than before. Seven times worse. It couldn't get any worse. The significance of the number seven. Right? And consequently, the spiritual condition of Israel will be worse than it's ever been. This wicked and evil generation, Jesus says. It's going to be even worse than Israel at the time of the exile. Why? Why are they worse off? Because they are rejecting not just the Messiah, but God himself once again who has come to his people to save them. Coming in the person of his son, Jesus, coming in a new and more complete way than he has ever before. And Israel, more than anyone, should have known. They should have recognized him. But instead, they reject him. Instead, they're going to kill him. What about our generation? Well, we've got the evidence. We've, we have the pages of the New Testament. We have the witness of people uh, in our lives, people we may know who have come to faith and, and can witness about the way that Jesus has changed their life forever. We have the history of the church. In fact, we have history full stop. And you have to do some quite amazing mental gymnastics. You have to do some amazing work to ignore all this evidence. If you're someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, the question isn't really, where's the proof? The question really is, do you want to believe? Because Jesus makes it abundantly clear once again. How you respond to Jesus is the most important decision anyone could possibly make. Because we're talking about something with eternal consequences. If you trust in Jesus, praise God, may you continue to fix your eyes on him. But if you're someone who's questioning whether you do, or maybe you just say, no, that's not for me right now, what, what's really stopping you? Do you think it's proof? Because it's there, waiting for you to investigate. Ask yourself, do you want to believe? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you came in him in the most amazing and wonderful revelation of who you are. And you came in the person of your son, not to just reveal, but to save. And so we thank you that in Christ, through his death and resurrection, we have salvation. Lord, I thank you for the gospel message. And I pray that that message would change lives, continue to change lives here today. Now, Lord, I pray for anyone who may be watching who doesn't yet know you, who perhaps is questioning, why would I want to believe? And I pray that you would make that clear to them. I pray that you would help them to fix their eyes on Jesus, the one who is King, the one who is our Saviour. And we pray all this now in Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, I will not see you, but you may see me tomorrow.